Hi everybody, it is Vicki Ross, and I happened to film another of my Inktober 2020 head studies, and I thought you guys might enjoy it. I'm working in my Arteza Mixed Media Journal, and the paper on the background of this page is from Robin McClendon's scripting class. It's on uh, calligraphy paper, and then I tea-stained it. So, you know, I just decided to put that down for an interesting background. And this is an old master copy, which will be obvious. I'm just finishing up the drawing here. Don't you love I that used piece? a pencil uh, to kind of get my first scratchy drawing done because once you put ink down, it's down. So trying to save myself some grief um, before I put my ink on having something to go by. And I'm probably studying. It takes a lot of back and forth. You'll spend more time staring at your photograph than you will your drawing. I've gotten out my casein paints, and I'm going to um, paint some white where the collar is and a few other white places. I do that a lot when I'm, when I'm wanting to, um, I don't want to fight the black or in this case the tan tea stain in the background. And of course I didn't wet it beforehand, so... Y'all have to wait for me to do that. Do not use your best Kalinsky brushes on casing with casing um, because it dries quickly and so it's easier to leave your brush. And you do have to, um, if you don't re-wet it first, you're going to have to scrub around a little bit in the pan. I had gotten lost in the drawing over the black, that big black area, so I'm going to fix that so that I, I know where I'm going. This is the very first time I've done an online challenge for something like Inktober, ICAD, ICAR today, and I actually finished it, so I was tickled with myself. The reason why I stuck with it is because it's my favorite subject's heads. Favorite subject of heads, head studies. And I got the idea from drawwithchris.com, Chris Legaspi, I'm not saying that right, um, who is a professional illustrator. A lot of his work is finished to photorealism. But I've counted this basically as just practice. Practice, practice, practice. I tell people all the time that you you don't sit down at a piano when you're seven or eight and play Beethoven. Or, God forbid, that you sit down and you are Beethoven and you write your music. <laughs> so, you start out with scales. Or one little Indian, you know, playing with one finger with three notes. Um... And it's the same thing with painting and drawing. You have to put in the hours of practice. You have to spend some time understanding what it is that you're looking at. And then as time goes by, um, understanding what you're looking at, like a forehead or a bulge on a nose or the brow line, those just come automatic and you've got the... <clears throat> eye hand coordination in your memory bank and I've really really done a lot of head studies once I started doing them in journals and if one turned out really good I could tear it out if I wanted to um, but usually they're two-sided there's their starting place they're a practice place it's a place for discovery it's a place for goofing and trying to figure out how to fix it so it becomes a challenge 
And it, that has worked really well for me to keep me going. Because I've got that same old problem everybody else does. Oh, my good paper. Oh, my, I don't want to use my, my best stuff. You know, what if it's not any good? Well, what if it is good? And there you are stuck because you didn't use your best stuff. And I don't care how much people worry about being copied. Don't. Don't waste your time with it. If somebody copies your work and tries to paint like you did, now if they're taking your intellectual property, that's different. But as far as your painting goes, because you're going to be so good that you'll be long past that stage by the time they start copying you, you're, you're undoing something else. Um, and to prove that, I have tried several times to copy myself and can't do it. So take that to heart as well when you're learning to paint or watching someone do a demonstration that yours is never going to look exactly like theirs because if they do theirs over it will never exactly look like theirs so hold that thought in the back of your head um, it's it's okay to try to emulate a tutor that's how you learn and that's been the learning for centuries is copying somebody you like you can see his face emerging now in the white collar this is usually about the stage that I've realized my drawing is off I constantly measure from my source photo to my paper all the time um, and those of you who've watched some of my videos know that I I try to always have my source picture the same size as my painting I can do it if it's smaller but you know having to go over and say okay the eye here is an inch and on my drawing I want it to be an inch and a half well, so then that's easy to remember, but then you measure on your drawing from the nose to the brow line, and it's two eyes. So you got to go two eyes times one and a half, one inch times one and a half. So it gets a little bit confusing. It's just as easy now with all the technology that we have to do that. So that's what I constantly do. Um... I learned from the masters. This is a Rembrandt, I believe. Um, guess what? Theirs aren't always measured perfectly either. You know, their noses will be a little bit wider than than what we're all trained to do. And let me say right now that the measurements of the quote perfect face unquote are. It dates back to the ancient Greeks and their architecture and their application of the golden mean and the golden spiral and all that kind of stuff, which if you're not a geek, you don't need to study it. But you have the perfect face and then each face has some features that don't match the perfect face, like maybe an expression makes the nose look wider or uh, an eyebrow is higher on one side than the other because somebody's looking at you snarky. <clears throat> But the perfect face measurements are an excellent way to begin. And then you can make adjustments. And after, you know, 100 million faces, you'll learn to see that measurement automatically. Or I've been told. <laughs> I also want to talk a little bit about drawing. Drawing is a media art form all by itself you you learn how to draw to draw and that's your finished project so drawing like that would be charcoal or pencil you know ink when you draw and you're going to paint on top of it you're drawing for painting so you may just have some marks you know like where the eye is a line and and where the nose and the mouth are and then you just start painting them what I was measuring right there, or drawing right there, is uh, Chris showed us a method of, of 
emulating the eye socket because people get confused over the eye and they don't know exactly what they're doing. But the eye socket is a pretty good size hole uh, in your head. It's about, it's about, it's the eyeball comes from side to side. So, and then the top and bottom are equal. And the eyeball is a perfectly round ball. If your eye measures one inch, then the ball is one inch circle. So it's really big. And then on top of that is where you get your eyelids, your eyelashes, and so on. So one of the, one of the exercises that you can do is to actually draw that, you know, lightly and roughly, draw that full circle before you try to put an eye, eyeball in or before you try to do an eye. Do the underground work first and you'll come out with a better result on the other side. And I think I'm using a dip pen here. I had trouble finding an ink pen that didn't take over my work. And by that I mean we started out using a ballpoint pen. <clears throat> and it was just the lines were so big even though I was using a 0.5 millimeter or 0.25 millimeter. A tea tiny little point. It still seemed to be stark, and you saw the lines more than you saw the face. So I'm a painter first, and I typically draw just enough to get a base for my oil painting. So this is a uh, challenge for me. Nope, that's still a pencil. And it is a, oh, I have to look, Stabilo pencil. I could tell by the little symbol on the bottom of the pencils. And one of my major challenges uh, with art in general is to slow down. So I always act like there's a timer on me and I've got to finish it in 15 minutes. So you'll see me try to slow down here and there. Uh, I've pulled in a brush pen from Arteza. This is their real brush pen. It works like a watercolor brush pen, um, but the <clears throat> the color inside it is ink, so it's fine for journaling. And uh, I I probably wouldn't use any ink based product in something I was going to sell, <clears throat> but you can take great photographs of it and make prints from it. And the ink fading factor has nothing to do with what what you're doing. See, there's always a workaround. Now, I got these pens a couple months ago and have not really put them through their paces, which I need to do. This, again, is not the quite appropriate paper for them because this is absorbent. <laughs> Their best results would come from a hot press, <clears throat> hot press paper, or um, a special drawing paper that was coated, watercolor paper. I think I said that, didn't I? <laughs> uh -huh. And I think maybe if I had had a water brush handy, I could have 
softened all the color on this level and then save the darker colors for later. But I did it. It's a good idea, though. So put it on and then use a water brush to help it spread out on this kind of paper. I got the Arteza alcohol markers, the Everblends, and tried to do a face using them on Upo, I believe. It was one of the plastic papers. And it didn't didn't work. I made it work in the end. It was not anything that I would write home about. But um, they used marker paper for their alcohol pencils and um, alcohol pens. And I don't think I have any drawing paper. I know, hush back there in the peanut gallery. I've got everything else that an art store would have. An excellent exercise for you is, no matter what medium you're working in, is to um, use a monotone or um, a grisaille, G-R-I-S-A-I-L-L-E. The old masters use those under their paintings almost all the time because the earth pigments, the browns, were free or almost free, where the bright colors were very hard to get and very, very expensive. So they would do all the planning and the composition work and all that before they went to color. So the color could just be a glaze on top. That's how they maximized their paint availability situations. But it's good because you don't have to worry about color. All you have to worry about is levels. And that is tones of black and white. I've done some grisaille. Grisaille is gray. So using a gray color. Um, the one that I like to do under heads is white for it. It's Italian and it means green. Ver Verdaccio, I think. And because green is the complement of red and the flesh tones are a red of sorts, a warm color, then the gray underneath helps you get your uh, cooler color on where things go darker. And things go darker when? Yeah, Tommy, you got it. It's when they're curving away from the light. That's when you'll see a dark shadow come up. And in order to make that, that curve back to the dark side of the light um, is a darker value and a cooler color. So the green with the red on top of it gives you a cooler color as it's going over the, the form. And that, my friends, is how you take a two-dimensional thing into a replication of a three-dimensional. And if you really want to fool somebody, put a drop shadow on the item that you're doing. And it really does look like you could reach out and touch it. I'm doing a little bit of drawing correction in here. And my head turns out to be way bigger than, than the collar should be. So that could have made it a caricature. I could have caricature hell's, hell's bells. Um, the big black circle underneath his head could be his suit coat. And then a couple of short stubby legs underneath that. That would have been fun. It would look like the camera was up above him. It's funny how I think about these things when I'm not painting.
All righty. I've spilled something. I wonder what it is. Oh, those are pen nibs. Okay. Okay, dip pen in hand, and this is my, um, what do they call that, asymmetric? Anyway, it's where the pen nib sits to the side of the pen holder so that you can see a little bit better what you're doing, and that helps a lot. Yeah, I guess in calligraphy, lettering, and in drawing with it. So I found a nib that worked in... We're going into it now with a sepia colored ink. No telling how old it is. So I got it from a friend who was downsizing for a retirement home. So she'd probably had it 20 years. But never goes old. I had fits with the beard.
always put the lid back on that ink bottle because the one time that you don't, you'll spill it and you'll know from then on. Okay, we're getting the casein back now. Um, casein is a new media for me. Um, medium. Medium is one and media is more than one. Casein is one of the oldest art forms in the world. Um, and it is made by pigment being ground up into um, a milk product. I, um, and it's a, an emulsion that you can make your own, but it's just easier to buy it for $10. Um, Jack Richardson has one. <clears throat> I love the way it smells. It smells kind of milky. <laughs> And once it dries, remember the old uh, milk paint from the 60s and 70s that everybody was trying to copy? Um, milk paint is casein, basically. It's, uh, it was used to paint tables and chairs and stuff. So if you collected um, country pieces like pie safes and things like that that had milk paint left on them, you could not get that paint off. You just had to cover it. So this is um, an artist's version of casein. Or milk paint. And it's, uh, uh, you can rework it for a while, like maybe a day, but you know, after four or five days, it's cured and pretty much permanent. You might be able to get it off with mineral spirits or <clears throat> um, alcohol or something like that, but it's meant to be permanent. And it applies a lot like gouache, um, but the reworking, with gouache you have to be careful because you'll start picking up all the underneath layers if you don't let them dry thoroughly in between. And this dries quicker, so you can come back over it more times without it dissolving, and then you're working with one, one jumbled up pigment instead of three or four different layers. Of course, I use gouache and casein like I do paint. I like to see the under layers show through. And most people use gouache as a flat color, like an illustration. You know, like a Dick and Jane book where the dress is one color of blue all over. Yeah. I'm adding some white highlights with the casein. Now, depending on how dark this, I mean, uh, how much water, excuse me, yeah, water, Water or emulsion I have in this paint will determine what, how opaque it is. So a lot of times when I'm doing a light layer, it'll disappear or fade back. And then you look at it and decide if it was enough. And if it wasn't, then you put another coat on. The more you practice and, and paint with it, the better off you'll be. Isn't that a pretty set of brush pens there? And the cases that come with them are awesome.
the more I paint on this, the more it looks like a turn-of-the-century American politician instead of a Rembrandt. Carry on. What I'm doing here is kind of weaving the white of his collar into the hair on his beard. I told you, I can get down realistic now. And part of his beard in the front, you had a slightly darker beard hair over the white collar then when the beard went over the black area, it turned um, lighter than the background. So that was fun. <laughs> but like I always say, knowing what it is, is half the battle. I have no idea what I did there, except I think it involved a Bic highlighter or a whiteout pen. I'm pretty sure it did since it's laying right there to the side. So I'm coming back in now with some of the um, stays on pencil, which if you get it wet or when you get it wet, it's going to dissolve. But I'm trying to put some form into the collar. And those things are made up of like ripples. 
So you have kind of a honeycomb look on the on the very edge. And then that damn beard. <laughs> Let's fast forward this and see where we are.
If six different mediums don't work, let's try some more. Because I'm getting ready to get out some glitter watercolor. That <laughs> cracked me up. And that beard looks really funny with the black in his head and the rest of his hair is brown. That would have been a huge difference. But. Journals are for playing and experimenting. And the next time I do something in a sepia tone and then pick up a black pencil, I'm going to go, whoa, 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 wait a minute. Whoa, whoa, whoa. I should have quit an hour ago. But I didn't. He just got hit right in the middle of the forehead with a club. But you gotta laugh. A lot of artists will not let you see their make readies or practice pieces. I've had these Pearl X watercolor paints for probably 20 years. Hobby Lobby used to sell them. And they were made by USA ArtQuest. And they are loaded with pigment. Of course, anything with Pearl X would be. Um, but if you can't find these, you can make your own. Just put gum Arabic with a little bit of Pearl X powder and mix it up real good and put it into a palette. Now what are we digging for? Let's throw the kitchen sink at this guy. Okay, this is acrylic ink. I mean acrylic paint now. But there's some ink in there, I swear.
Somebody get the hook. Hurry, get the hook. Put this person out of our misery. She went back over the... <laughs> she, see, I'm not even claiming her now. Uh, went back over the beard again. This time with some craft paint. Make the beard brown, not black. Do you think she heard me? No. Nah. Do you think she would listen if she did? Mm, nah, probably not. <laughs> Ooh. I've seen some of my tutors in uh, moments of distress just take a painting off the easel and tear it into pieces and then they start over that's where this one is Now back with the paint. This is another issue that I have, and I'm going to talk about it because some of you may have it too. If I'm not doing it for real, you know, like, you know, this is going to be something I'm going to put in a show or a commission or something like that. If it's not for that, I tend to get real sloppy. And that is exactly what you're seeing here. I'm thinking, oh my God, it's adult beverage time and I hadn't got this thing finished yet. Alrighty, we're going to stick this out to the bitter end. Rembrandt 1, Vicky 0. And then I'm going to, if you stick with me, I'm going to show a picture that I took right after it was finished and a picture I took today. That looks like a brown pencil, I mean a brown marker right there. So maybe, maybe she figured it out. I don't know. What do you think? I'm um, claiming that Arteza's brush markers are really ink so that it qualifies <laughs> like somebody's going to throw you out if you don't do it with ink I did iCAD a day once started it with Shannon Green I got four done the day we were working together never did another one <laughs> that was supposed to go on for a year I think it was a year maybe it was just a month either way I couldn't do it or didn't do it but then I made some with Robin McClendon, and I made quite a few, and I think I'm going to save them and use them in uh, journals rather than put them in a Rolodex. So that means that big Rolodex I have, that steel one with the lid that closes, uh -huh. I won't need it.
Those little bitty baby hands. This is why, too, um, if you're painting a picture for your wall or for somebody else, work on it for a session, a day or two, and then turn that sucker toward the wall, let it dry, or well, it, if it's oil. Um, turn it toward the wall and then look at it in a couple of days and you'll see things like baby hands and black beard instead of brown beard. I mean, you'll see stuff like that more readily. Like I'm seeing a lot of this stuff now looking through this video. And he does have some sort of a little beanie cap on. I would say newsboy cap, but since this was 15th century, I doubt it. I hope that you will use this as a learning experience for some of what you do. Um, this is not meant to be critiqued or bragging about, you know, how good I am or whatnot. I mean, in the beginning, when you learn to paint, you turn out maybe a half of one out of every ten that's worth keeping. And as you pro progress through your mile of paintings um, you might get up to where you're hmm, five six out of ten that are good and I don't know that anybody ever gets up to a ten out of ten maybe Richard Schmid so stay with me and I'll show you those oh boy here we go back with something else See, my paint keeps soaking into those areas, and when I look at it and then there's no value changes, I go back with, with the paint. And I think you'll really see it when I show you the today's version after it's been sitting in a journal for a couple of days, no, a couple of weeks, really. Alrighty, if you sat through this this long, you deserve a star. So give yourselves a star. And I will see you in the next experiment. Bye-bye. It's Vicky. Signing off. I'll see you next week.